thought maybe we'll start by, uh, you know, start from the very beginning, uh, where, you know, you, you, in the first 14 pages, you talk about your, you know, your, your personal motivation to write this right. book. Uh, and so maybe you can sort of share this with everybody. So, you know, this book um, grows out of three strands which are interlinked. Um, the first strand is um, actually grew out of, out of the first book. So I'm a cancer biologist. I'm a cancer geneticist. Um, we've, our lab has discovered some of the genes, not some of the, some of the important genes in, in leukemias and lymphomas, and we're working on them. So one question that is, was raised by Emperor uh, is that if cancer is um, the, the pathological version of our normal selves, as I call it, um, famously uh, quoting from Beowulf, Harold Varmus uh, quoted from Beowulf um, in, um, at Stockholm, um, then what's the normal version of our normal selves? Uh, how does, how, how, why are we not, all of us, bursting with cancer? Um, what keeps, what regulates um, normalcy? Um, an example that I often give my students, um, which actually remains unsolved, is um, when, you, when you cut yourself um, and there's a wound in your body, why don't you grow a new limb um, every time, like a plant or a tree, like a new branch? Um, it's not clear, actually, why you don't. Um, so what makes it possible, then, to maintain normalcy and that, of course, raises the question, which we'll come to, I'm sure, what normalcy is. How do we define normalcy across various parameters? So, so, so the first strand, therefore, was, was cancer. This book is, I, I like to call it, a, a prequel to the sequel um, of Emperor. It's like Star Wars. Um, so that's, that was one strand. The second strand um, was um, technology. So what had happened, and we'll talk a little bit about this in, um, in writing the book, is that while the book was being written, um, astonishing new technologies were bursting on the scene of, of, of the gene. Um, and I just wanted to talk about two of those technologies. Again, we'll go into greater depth, but this is, serves as a kind of landscape introduction. But the two astonishing technologies, one was, of course, the depth of gene sequencing. Um, understanding the sequence of the human genome, but added, added, of course, we had been sequencing genes for a while. We used to, um, you know, every time we had to sequence a gene, um, I don't know how many of you remember this, but we had to take these two gigantic glass plates, uh, which were almost impossible to manipulate, and pour uh, a gel uh, in between those two glass plates, a liquid between those two glass plates, and if there was one bubble, it would ruin the sequence. So the, the art of pouring, the, they were about this big, um, and you have to you know, move them, um, put a, you know, sellotape them on the side, and then pour this liquid, and if there was one bubble in the whole thing, the whole thing would be ruined. So um, that was the old technology, and all of a sudden, new automated technologies, basically, still gel-based, but rapid automated technologies began to appear. And the capacity to sequence grew enormously, gigantically, by leaps and bounds. And again, we'll talk about how much they grew. But the consequence of that technology was that all of a sudden you could sequence whole genomes or even parts of genomes, um, which meant, in turn, for instance, you could sequence, and we'll, I mean, now I'm starting to get into the territory of the book, you could sequence a, f a fetus's genome before the fetus was born. Um, in fact, you could sequence a genome, you could pop out a biopsy, a single cell, out of an unborn fetus, keeping the rest of the fetus alive, and sequence the genome of that unborn child, and decide to implant that, that child, because that child would still be alive, that fetus would still be alive. So already the universe was, the known universe was crumbling, and at the same time, within the next two, two to three years, Yet another technology appeared in which we could change the human genome in a directional manner. And we need to understand some words here. The genome is uh, a word that we've used to describe the entire set of all information that uh, an organism possesses. So basically, it's all our genes and all the stuff that's in between genes, the sequences that are between genes. So the human genome, we now know, contains three billion 
uh, pieces of uh, uh, nucleotides of DNA, and the information is written in just four bases. It's written in A, C, T, and G. So the human genome, if you were to read the genome, would read A, C, T, G, G, C, 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 T, G, and so forth. Now, if it was an encyclopedia, if it was published as a book, in fact, with this font, um, it would be 66 full sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So you would walk into this room, and every wall would be covered with um, 66 full sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And what you could do is you could pick out, you know, set 17, volume 4, number 3, and it would read, you would open it to page 4, and it would read A, C, T, G, G, C, C, T, G, C, 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 and so forth. And it would be totally inscrutable to you and me. And yet, your first embryonic cell can use that three billion letter sequence to build you and me and to make sure that you and I, for the most part, have 10 fingers and not 15, as I said. And we share all these similarities, and yet you look different from me. Right? So that information in that sequence has that, has that capacity. So as I said, the first technology was the capacity to now derive the sequence across all those three billion nucleotides, and that was, of course, the Human Genome Project. Um, that was one technology. And the second technology was even more astonishing, and it wasn't even, it didn't, it wasn't, it, did, it, wasn't, it didn't exist when I started writing the book, but it began to appear as the book was being written, and that is technologies that allowed us, and now allow us, to go into this encyclopedia, identify one word of your choice, erase that word, and potentially change it for a different word. So this has been called genetic surgery. It's been called genomic engineering. Uh, it's called lots of different ways. Now, you could say, well, why does this matter? Well, that word may be the word that specifies your risk for having an increased risk for autism. That word might be the word that uh, changes your risk for having an increased risk for a terrifying neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it might be, in some people's conception, we'll talk about this as well, um, uh, a gene variant that increases height um, or a gene variant that reduces your risk for obesity. Um, so these were, this technology was been, has been called CRISPR-Cas9. There are a thousand new words for it. So these two pieces of technology, which I call reading and writing the genome, reading it because you can read all the three billion odd base pairs, and writing it because you can now edit it as if you were working on a word processor, you could edit it, suddenly began to appear, um, and I be we began to use it. And the astonishing thing was how easy it was. So that was strand two. Strand one, as I said, was cancer. Strand two was this reading and writing the genome. And perhaps the most important one, that's why I kept it last, was the personal. Um, the story of my own family's history of mental illness is the backdrop to all of this book. Um, this book wouldn't exist if it wasn't for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in my family. Um, and the desire to find out what was behind it. Why is it that some members are affected and some members are not affected? And I would say this is the story of every family. Uh, it's the story. There is no family where there is not such a discussion or not such a kind of discussion about some kind of illness, some kind of propensity, some kind of change in destiny or fate where um, all of a sudden it, the, 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 the gene doesn't become something that's vastly impersonal, something that happens in some laboratory somewhere, but all of a sudden comes and rests in you because we're talking about the two things that human beings have cared about since the beginning of time, identity and heredity. How we are, why we are who we are, why likeness exists, and how we transmit likeness to our children. Um, you know, these are, if there are two obsessions in human history, uh, beyond any obsession, I think it is, you know, the, the, the question of, of identity and heredity. Um, and so this became a question for me because I had now two uncles and a cousin who were affected. Um, why was it not everyone? What, why was it skipping generations? And the, how colored, how deeply it colored my childhood and adolescence 
was becoming more, uh, uh, more apparent. They, they say if you use the color cobalt blue in a painting, the painting is forever changed. Nothing, nothing remains the same if you put one drop of cobalt, and maybe it has to do with the way we look at cobalt, maybe it has to do with the way the eye sees that blue. Um, if you use one drop of a personal story in a book, it colors the whole story. It will change the entire book forever. Um, and so you have to be extremely, in fact, you have to be very, very careful with the cobalt blue of personal stories um, in any book, um, uh, particularly in a book like this. And so, but there was nowhere to avoid it. Uh, the, the book begins there, uh, much like Emperor did, and of course it colors the whole, the whole book. So that, then let me ask you a seemingly simple question. If there's a parent who's six feet, let's take height as a trait, right? Uh, a parent is six feet. The other parent is three feet. So um, why doesn't the child become six or three versus something in between? Well, so that's again, so, so that, was the, that was the very confusing piece. So, so Mendel's prediction would be that if the child is six feet, and if there's a parent who's six feet tall and a child is three feet tall, then the child should either be, either be one or the other because the information is digitized or quantized, and, um, and, and, and the information be produced like that. It turns out that most human traits, most traits, are not governed by one gene. So height, we now know, has about five dominant genes, and uh, if, so what really is happening is that the five genes, each of which is quantized in one parent, and the five genes, the five gene variants, each of which is quantized in the other parent is mixing together. None of the individual particles are changing, but their interaction is ultimately producing a child whose height might be 4.5 feet or five, you know, seven, whatever, whatever number of feet. And the analogy that I use, in fact, which is the reason this book has this cover, um, is that if you take seven pieces of colored paper, seven pieces of different colored paper, you can mix and, and, and put them all together, juxtapose them together, and if you look at the juxtaposition, you can actually create all the colors, or not all the colors, most of the colors of the human spectrum, right? But those seven individual pieces of colored paper haven't changed. So what's, what's astonishing about it is, and to continue the analogy, the father, in this case, has seven pieces of colored paper. The mother, in this case, has seven pieces of colored paper. The child is produced by a juxtaposition of those seven plus seven pieces of colored paper, five plus five in the case of height, uh, of colored paper, to produce something that looks in color unlike any one of those individual pieces. But here's the most important point none of those individual pieces of colored paper has changed. None of those individual pieces of transparent paper has changed. When that child now reproduces again with another child, they will again bring together five sheets of transparent paper, another five sheets of transparent paper, and create an overlap, creating the unbelievable diversity that you see in the faces in this audience. But here's what's amazing about it. None of those individual pieces have changed. Yeah. The one driblet of information, the one quanta of information that carried that one quanta that colored your eye is still there. And if you went into the human genome, if you looked through the encyclopedia, you would find it, and it would still be there as a quantum. So each one of us is a dictionary for our ancestors. Each one of us has to be a dictionary for our ancestors. Our ancestors. It, is a, it is a necessity of genes that each one of us carries in ourselves a dictionary for the end of our ancestors.